Hi, everybody. Welcome to Hey Doc, What's New in Plant-Based Medicine. I'm your host, Lisa Carlin, and I am so excited that I am interviewing my, my favorite mentor, my favorite role model, probably the most interesting plant-based physician in the entire world, Dr. Neil Barnard. How are you, Dr. Barnard? Well, thank you, Lisa. What a lovely introduction. Great to be with you today. So tell me, what is new in plant-based medicine? Seems like just about everything. Um, not only are there new research studies coming out all the time, including from here, uh, but there are new resources. And as you know, meat eating is taking a nosedive while all the new vegan products are coming in like gangbusters. So it's an exciting new world. Yeah, it, it, re it really is. Is there a specific thing that's new in plant-based medicine? Because we keep learning, you know, we keep learning as time goes on how plant-based diets are good for yet another illness, yet another chronic disease. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, well, the, the new uh, fields, things started out with heart disease and weight problems and diabetes and hypertension, and that's all as important as ever. But then a few years ago, the new focus was on brain diseases. And so we're now discovering that if you want to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, plant-based diet is the way to go. And I think the new frontier um, now is on hormonal conditions. Uh, things like menstrual cramps or hot flashes or hormone-related cancers that people thought would never in a million years have anything to do with anything you can, can control. It turns out that diet changes, if they're done the right way, are really uh, instrumental there too. And you've just written a new book. Tell us about the book. Yeah, it's uh, called Your Body in Balance. And we're tackling all the major hormone issues. For example, let's say a couple has been struggling with infertility for a long period of time. And they never imagined that the issue could have been things that they're eating for breakfast. Or a young, a young woman or teenage girl has got menstrual cramps that are keeping her out of school or away from work. Uh, never imagining that foods could have anything to do with the hormones that are causing that. Or let's say a woman has got hot flashes that are driving her crazy. And every night she's having night sweats as well. And her doctor is saying, well, maybe you could take this medication, but it will cause cancer. She wants a better response than that. And that's where foods really come in big time. And of course, thyroid diseases, diabetes, all the issues where some kind of hormone haywire is causing our symptoms. That's where foods come to the fore. So I'm very excited to talk with you about that. So, so tell me, how did you discover that foods play a role in hormonal control? Gotta tell you, Lisa, it was a complete accident. I, I was here in my office, the phone rang, and it was a young woman who had cramps. Now, many women have menstrual cramps, but for maybe one in 10 or something like that, they are just off the scale cannot function type cramps. And that was her situation. So I said, okay, let me give you some heavy duty painkillers for today, tomorrow. But then I thought, what about next month? How are we gonna get through that month and the next month and the next month and the next month? And I made, I have to say, I made an educated guess, which was if we could use foods to reduce the amount of estrogen in her blood, that would reduce the uterine changes next month. And we, we already had an idea about how to do that because of breast cancer. We knew for a long time that women who have had breast cancer in the past, uh, if you reduce the amount of fat they eat or boost fiber, the amount of estrogen in their blood will go down and that makes it less likely that the cancer will progress. So I thought, all right, well, what are, what are cramps? Cramps are the lining of the uterus has thickened up too much under the influence of estrogen. So let's use high fiber, low fat foods to tackle estrogens for that. So I suggested this to this young woman. I said, for the next month, how about this? Two things, no animal products, it's gonna be vegan, totally vegan, but also keep oils really, really, really low. So that means oils gone, avocados, I'm sorry, gone, uh, uh, peanut butter, all the fatty foods gone. She discovered that it was a complete cure for her unless you'd kind of go back to the greasy foods and then the pain, kick, pain came back. So anyway, uh, we did a randomized clinical trial with Georgetown University, proved that this works. And in the course of this study for cramps, one of our research participants who was infertile or, or thought she was infertile, <laughs> suddenly became pregnant. And we thought, oh my God. So, so now it's not just the menstrual pain, it's also fertility issues. So we started discovering 
that there are all kinds of, uh, of reasons why either for the guy, why is his sperm count suppressed? Or for a woman, why is she not ovulating regularly? And we discovered that you can use nutrition on both of those. Just to give you a, a really quick, uh, a quick example, when men consume cheese, they're getting hormones from a cow. The hormones are estrogens and they are an exact match for the hormones in a wo woman's body or a man's body. And the trace of hormones in cheese are, are very small. But your average guy consumes 37 pounds of cheese in a year. So it, it builds up. And researchers in Rochester, New York, discovered that high cheese intake is associated with low sperm counts. So the beauty of it is it changes fast. So the guy says, okay, all right, vegan diet, count me in. And immediately you have eliminated the exogenous estrogens from his diet. Or for a woman, she's concerned about her ovarian function. Uh, she can not only avoid those hormones, but when she avoids dairy, something else happens that's really, really important. She's avoiding lactose. Now, I'm sure people listening to this are thinking, lactose, what, what is that? That's the sugar that is in milk and gives you an upset stomach so you don't have lactose milk. And yeah, 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 it, that's true. But there's way more to it. The milk sugar is actually the biggest nutrient in the milk, more than fat, more than protein, more than calcium. There's all this sugar in it. The sugar is lactose. And it breaks apart in your body. The lactose breaks apart to release a tiny sugar called galactose that is toxic to the ovaries. Mm -hmm. two, two issues. One is it's linked to ovarian cancer. The more milk women drink, the higher the risk of ovarian cancer. But before that is, of an, is a, an issue, it affects fertility. And researchers have looked at milk drinking across various countries, and then they look at fertility decline uh, for, for all women. Your fertility is maybe maximal in your mid-20s, and when you hit your mid-30s or late 30s, it's declining. In Thailand, not a big dairying country, the drop-off in fertility is maybe 20-25% during that interval, between the late 20s and late 30s. United States, big milk drinking country, the, the, the drop in fertility for a, woman who's, for a woman who's, say, 28 to a woman who's 38, it's about 80%. Uh, also true in a place like, say, New Zealand, also a dairying country. So what we think here is, it's pro in this case, it's not the estrogen. It's probably the lactose in the milk, uh, in the yogurt that you're consuming that is toxic to the ovary. So the beauty of this is you don't have to go to, to the pharmacy to fill a prescription. You don't have to wait. You can today decide I'm not going to be in this dairy experiment anymore. I'm going to leave it out. And, and you stop consuming the dairy products, stop consuming the meat products. And that appears to be really important for fertility. How interesting is that? Yes. Yeah. The lactose, because the, lacto the lactose is made up of glucose and galactose. So I guess there's a galactose for every glucose. So there's probably a that's fair right. amount of it. That, that, that's exactly right. And, and probably the worst of it even is a, a person who goes to the store and they, they get lactose-free milk right. uh, called lactate. Right. Because it's pre-digested so that the, the lactose is all broken up in advance. But what it's broken into is glucose and galactose molecules. So when you drink that milk, you're getting straight galactose, a pre-digested pre into the galactose. And it's no answer at all. Uh, if you have soy milk, rice milk, uh, almond milk, hemp milk, uh, they, don't, they don't have the galactose in them. Correct. Correct. Because there's, there's no lactose. The lactose comes from a cow or from an animal. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And normally you wouldn't really be exposed to it. Yeah. Um, there, there really are very few, few sources of it. And so after the age of weaning, Mother Nature thought, well, nobody's going to drink milk at all. So the ovaries would be safe. Yeah. But human beings being so creative and restless, we figured out how to have ice cream and all kinds of other things. And so we're suddenly bombarding a poor woman's ovaries yeah. with this uh, toxic galactose. Now, we need more research on all these, on all these areas. But we have seen over and over again how, how fertility can be affected. And, and by the way, one other thing, Lisa, if you don't mind my mentioning, uh, one of the real painful conditions, really painful conditions is endometriosis. Yeah. And this is where the cells that line the uterus appear to have escaped. It looks like they swim up the fallopian tubes and then they implant all around the abdomen and they swell and they bleed and they cause pain. Um, estrogen is the driver for that too. So a high fiber diet, that means beans and vegetables and fruit, that brings estrogen down. A low fat diet, 
brings estrogen down. Getting away from dairy brings estrogen down. And for many women, it is exactly the cure that they and have. Lots, there's for. lots of estrogen in meat as well. Well, um, farmers don't want to leave things to chance, so they inject. Um, if you go out into the field and you'll see a little pellet uh, in the ear of the steer, and it could be testosterone, it could be estrogen, it could be synthetics also. Um, now, people will argue that the amount in the meat is really trivial, that that may be true, uh, but why subject yourself to these? I have to say, I think that dairy itself is really a big actor here because, because the cow, cows make estrogen anyway, and so get into the milk, but when they're on in the dairy line, they are artificially inseminated every year, they're impregnated every year, and they are milked during their pregnancy. And so that means you're gonna have estrogen and progesterone in the, in the milk you're drinking, and the estrogen will match yours, and y you do not want that. And, and of, course, of course, it's not just menstrual pain, infertility, endometriosis, it's also breast cancer. Uh, I gotta tell you, Lisa, there was an article that came out about three, four months ago uh, from the Adventist Health Study 2. And they showed that dairy consumption increases breast cancer in women by about 50%. So that's the bad news. The good news is this means power. It means if I take that knowledge in hand, I can, can cut the risk of all these problems. Yes, my second show that I did of Hey Doc, What's New in Plant-Based Medicine was with Dr. Christy Funk. And she went into extraordinary detail about all of this and it was such a great show. So I yeah. really want everyone to know about the relationship between consuming dairy and breast cancer and prostate cancer and then how soy is protective. So let's go on to our next question. Are medications for hormone dysfunctions, are they overused? Massively. Massively so, um, and, and that's true for all of the conditions we talked about, menstrual cramps and so forth. Uh, where I'm particularly concerned is with hot flashes. A woman goes to the doctor and says, doc, I can't function. I'm sweating, I've got night sweats, this is driving me crazy. And the doctor says, well, you could take hormones, you could take Premarin. And what the doctor probably doesn't tell her until she asks is that Premarin is a shortening of the words pregnant mare's urine. And which means that horses are impregnated and then they're hooked up to a device that collects their urine and a pregnant horse makes estrogen. And you take it from the urine and you pack it into pills and sell it with this imaginative name Premarin. And the problem is that the list of side effects of Premarin and, and, of, and the other hormones too is as long as your arm, uh, including postmenopausal breast cancer. So we are encouraging people to think about other reason, uh, other ways of dealing with it. And, and don't, don't get me wrong, the hormones will reduce hot flashes, they sure will. But after a few years, the doctor says, we can't keep this up because the doctor is worried that he's putting his own head in the noose or, or she uh, by prescribing a drug that causes cancer. And at that point stops the prescription and then the hot flashes come back. So what, what you've sort of done is delayed them. And there has been some really interesting um, research recently on two things. One is weight loss through a plant-based diet or, or through any means reduces hot flashes to a good degree. So it's a great time to lose weight. The other thing is that soybeans seem to have an anti-hot flash effect. Mm -hmm. And this started out with just, um, you know, soy milk, tofu. And then some people got a little more adventurous and they would say, let me, let me have a bigger dose. They would take soy protein. And they've been, they've been reassured because uh, soy reduces breast cancer risk and it also reduces the likelihood of mortality if people have breast cancer. So soy seems to be good in that way. But I, I have to tell you, I was talking with somebody about two weeks ago who had read in my book, Your Body in Balance, about these soy studies and, and hot flashes. And she said, I wanna put this to the test. And she was already vegan, but she was still having some hot flashes. So she got her instant pot and she put her Laura soybeans in it. And she cooked up a big batch and put them in the fridge and she would have a half a cup of them every day. And she said in three days, her hot flashes were completely gone. So I thought that was amazing. And we've been hearing about this from a lot of people who have been making similar changes to their, to their diet and discovering that these hormonal shifts can be manipulated by the food choices that you're making. So interesting. All right, let's talk about diabetes. 
So insulin is a hormone and it plays a critical role in both type one and type two diabetes. And you've done a lot of research in diabetes and, and your, your book, your, your diabetes book is something that I use all the time and refer uh, clients and patients to. So um, tell us about your findings. Tell us about the relationship to diet and type one and type two diabetes. Yeah, I have to say- are very different. Yeah, yeah ex exactly. Um, and the same kind of diet helps for both conditions. And it really requires a complete rethink of, 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 of diabetes, which for us started in 2003. That was the year that NIH gave us a grant and said, find a better <laughs> treatment for diabetes. And so what we did is we started off with the current diets for diabetes, which were limiting carbohydrates and cutting calories. And, and they were, you know, they were okay. Um, they would reduce blood sugar, but we thought, how can I, how can I make this better? So what we discovered and, and well, what we used was a completely plant-based diet. We also kept oils to a bare minimum and we chose very healthy grains and beans and vegetables and fruits to make up the diet. And what we discovered is that the blood sugar lowering effect could be multiplied by about 300%. Uh, in other words, you had real power in bringing your blood sugar down. And that's when we started to see something for the first time, which was diabetes going away. I, I'm talking about a person who's had it for four or five years and they've been taking medicines and their insulin doses are going up. And suddenly the doctor says, I don't know how you, <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. Uh, apparently this vegan diet is working because you don't have diabetes anymore. And we got, I have to say, Lisa, we got so excited we started seeing people whose diabetes was was sent into complete remission as a result of the diet changes. And, and let me describe the reason for this because it's super important. Um, insulin is a hormone that goes from your pancreas to the cells of your body. And when the insulin arrives at the surface of the cell, it attaches to the surface. It's just like a key going into a lock. It opens up the surface of the cell to let the glucose inside. However, if you've been eating fatty stuff, salmon, uh, chicken, beef, cheese, the fat from these foods gets into your cells and that stops insulin from being able to work. So the insulin is still on the surface of the cell, just like a key trying to open up a door, but the cell is jammed full of fat and the door won't open. So at that point, the sugar builds up in the blood because it can't get into the cell. And your doctor says, you've got a high blood sugar. This is diabetes. Stop, don't eat any sugar anymore. Don't eat any bread because that will release sugar into your blood. That was never the problem. The problem was the cell couldn't take the sugar in. And it couldn't take the sugar in because it was full of fat. So our research said, okay, if I'm on a vegan diet, how much animal fat is there in the diet? There isn't any. Mm -hmm. And if we keep oils low, there's not much of any kind of fat. And so the amount of fat inside the cell starts to diminish. And the reason I know it diminishes is with a scanning technology called magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is very complex and very expensive, but you can, you can watch the fat dissipate as the individual starts this diet. And as they do, their body becomes responsive to insulin again, and the diabetes improves, the need for medication goes down, and eventually in some people, they just don't have the disease anymore. So that is the approach to type 2 diabetes, is to get the grease out of your diet, get the animal products out of your diet. And then we applied it for type 1. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in type 1, you still, you're always going to need insulin injections or some source of insulin because your, your, your body's not making it anymore. But what we found is that the same diet will reduce medication requirements by as much as 30%. Is that because their insulin sensitivity increases? I think so, yeah. Um, that, that, that Their body needed insulin injections because they didn't have any, but their body was not using it efficiently. And yeah. suddenly on a vegan diet, you're using it. And the other thing is if you've got uh, type, type 1 diabetes, people with type 1 diabetes don't typically die of a low blood sugar or a high blood sugar. They die of heart disease. The they die of kidney disease. Right. They right. Have, right. All these kinds of art, arterial problems. And so you don't want any cholesterol in your diet at all. You don't want a drop of animal fat in your diet. So for type one, just like type two, low fat, vegan diet, lots of vegetables, lots of fruits, beans, whole grains, and you'll discover that you need less medicine and you can live a normal life. You know, it's so frustrating for me because I talk to physicians all the time and they tell me, 
honey, you know, the, the protrusion. <laughs> honey, honey, don't you don't you understand diabetes is a disease of too much glucose in the blood? So you can't and you addressed this before. Why is it so difficult to get physicians, clinical physicians, to actually read the research and find out that there are other other mechanisms, other treatment modalities that actually work. It just yeah. seems that the, the learning curve just falls off when they're in practice for many, many years and they're just um, propagating the same thing. They're just, it's just putting, it's putting new band-aids on but never really treating the cause. They are, um, this will change. Um, I have to say, since we've been doing this work, um, so many people are using this approach now and they are, just day and night happier than than they were before. So so that's changing, and and there are doctors who are learning about it. And I one of the reasons I think this is going to change big time is I think it was last year at the American Diabetes Association. They they're they're big um, they, they're big uh, conference talk. It's the Banting Prize. Uh, the Banting Medal is given, and they gave it to Gerald Schulman. Gerald Schulman at Yale University, brilliant researcher, along with his wife Kit Peterson. They they're just great, great, great researchers. And they are the ones who have really been leading the charge to show the buildup of fat inside muscle and liver cells, how it affects insulin resistance, how uh, various diet changes can, can change it. And we've been working with them for quite some time. And uh, when Dr. Schulman stood up to the podium and, and addressed these, this huge uh, group of people, you could tell this was all news to them, <laughs> even though he and I and many others have been talking about this for many years now, and, and he has spoken, uh, he and Kit have spoken at our conference now a couple of times and shared their knowledge. Um, you can see that that it's just like the cobwebs are falling off the eyes of people who are saying, wait a minute, this is a much more powerful approach to diabetes than we ever had before. So it's good. And by the way, also for, for women who have PCOS, polycystic uh -huh. ovary syndrome, it's the same kind of diet um, because insulin resistance is a big issue in PCOS too. And so when women follow a plant-based diet, they tend to lose weight, which is great. Their insulin levels tend to come back down. Their insulin sensitivity tends to go up. So um, it's a wonderful thing. In, in, in Your Body and Balance, I describe the story of a young woman named Allison, who was, was and is living in Wisconsin. She's a dietitian, and she, she's got a tough job. She works with cancer patients and helps them adjust their diet. But she had PCOS, and she and her husband are concerned that they weren't able to have a baby, and, and she was concerned about the other effects of PCOS. And finally, she said, you know, maybe I should try this diet on me, on herself. Uh, she went vegan, and right away, her cycle got in gear. She got pregnant, has a beautiful baby uh, now, and, and, and she was, I have to say, has been a great partner in helping me to get the word out to other women who have PCOS, too, and she does just a wonderful job of educating people. So let's talk about erectile dysfunction, because that's something that plagues so many men. How, how does this kind of hormonal approach and dietary approach help, or help treat uh, erectile dysfunction? You know, I... Known as ED. Yeah, ED. Um, it's so many clinics, including ours, uh, here at the Barnard Medical Center. We have people coming in. It's the guy who comes in, and he's, he's got a euphemism that he's going to use. Um, he'll say, Doc... My, there's something wrong with my nature, or, <laughs> or, or doc, I, I can't quite raise the flag. And you know, the, the, our doctors have to kind of be ready for this code. Um, what he means is he's got erectile dysfunction. And so you could say, you know, you probably wanted a Viagra prescription, right? Yeah, that's, that's all I need. So you can write out the prescription and the guy grabs and says, thanks doc, and he runs out the door. At that point, you drop your pen, you race out the door behind the patient and you grab him before he gets on the elevator. You say, you gotta come back, we're not finished yet. And you can explain to him that the Viagra has a duration of action of a few hours. But the reason he has erectile dysfunction is that he's got narrowed arteries. That the arteries throughout the body are being attacked by cholesterol particles. Those cholesterol particles are more and more numerous based on what you've been eating and they irritate the artery wall and they produce what's sort of like a, a little growing, almost like a scar inside the artery wall. And that's called an atherosclerotic lesion. And the, the arteries to a man's private parts are pretty narrow anyway. 
And with a little bit of atherosclerosis, they just close down. And so the guy can't get it up anymore. Um, but what the doctor explains to the patient, and this is the most important thing, if you've got narrowed arteries down there, you got them also in the coronary arteries to your heart. And you probably have them in the arteries going to your brain tissue, meaning that you are at higher than average risk for a heart attack or for a stroke within the net, not, I don't, I'm not talking about 25 years from now, I'm talking about within three to four or five years from now. So take your Viagra, but that has nothing to do with your heart or your brain. So the, the, the doc, the, the patient now says, well, you got my attention doc. Uh, what do I do? I mean, I'm not eager to have a heart attack right now. So at that point we say plant-based diet has no animal fat in it at all and no cholesterol. And that will bring your cholesterol level down. That will allow the arteries a chance to reopen. So the patient says, that's great. Now I won't have a heart attack. Maybe my risk for stroke will diminish. True enough, great. So he starts doing the diet and he's really keen on it and his wife starts doing it with him. And after about two months, he comes back. He says, Doc, you won't believe this. I'm raising the flag again without Viagra. <laughs> what he discovered, we see this all the time. Um, what, what's all that's happened is the arteries open up and they don't have to open up very much. You just open up for, for physics students. The flow through a vessel is proportional to the fourth power of the radius, which means just a little bit, the very beginning of reversal of atherosclerosis causes this massive rush of blood. And so he wakes up at six o'clock in the morning with a big surprise. His wife is probably annoyed with him now, but anyway, be, be that as it may, um, erectile dysfunction very often goes away um, after several weeks on a plant-based diet. And that, and that seems to me, because that's one of the tiniest arteries in the body. I think it's only a millimeter in diameter and the coronary arteries are two millimeters in diameter. So that's really the one that's gonna be, I don't wanna use a speciesist bird in the coal mine, but it right. really is the indicator. It's the bellwether flag that lets an individual know that there is um, atherosclerosis systemically throughout their entire body. And that means all the tiny blood vessels in kidneys and brains and everywhere else. So it's just so wonderful to have such a powerful way of expressing that message. Well, let um, me say also that I think that doctors who are prescribing Viagra uh, or the other ED meds and are failing to tell the patient that they've got atherosclerosis are really taking a huge risk yeah. because some of those patients go on to have heart attacks or they go on to have strokes. And all it takes is some ambulance chasing lawyer to say, you, wait a minute, wait, they had a heart attack now. And two years ago, you prescribed them Viagra knowing they had atherosclerosis and you did nothing about it. So my advice to, to my fellow doctors is when you see a case of atherosclerosis or, or of ED, let the patient know they've got atherosclerotic disease and unless proven otherwise, and get them on a healthy plant-based diet. If they smoke, they gotta quit. Um, all those are the contributors to it. If not, you're just laying the uh, the platform for, 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 for a heart attack or stroke. Right, exactly. Let's talk about thyroid, because as your book is about your body and balance, all the different hormones which, which control, they're the regulators, so many of our organ systems, Many people have thyroid, either hyper or hypothyroidism. How does a plant-based diet address thyroid disorders? This has been really a surprise. Um, and for many people, the thyroid dis disorders are never diagnosed because they're vague. You got out of bed and you feel sluggish. And you step on the scale and you've gained a pound since two weeks ago. And your energy's not so good and you look in the mirror and there's something wrong with your hair or your skin, you don't feel right. And, and you feel this is just aging or I'm not sleeping enough or whatever. You go to see the doctor and the doctor says, wait a minute, low energy, mild weight gain, hair and skin changes, let me feel your neck. And the doctor puts your doctor's hands on the, at the base of your neck and says, ha, huh, I wanna do a blood test. Draws a blood test and says, I knew it. You're hypothyroid. You say, what are you talking about? Your thyroid gland here at the base of your neck makes thyroid hormone, which goes through the bloodstream to all the cells of the body to give them energy. And for a lot of people, it's not holding up its end. It's, it's not doing its job. And you're hypothyroid. Now there's two big reasons for that. One is a lack of iodine and the other is antibodies. The, the lack of iodine, pretty simple. Back in 1924, I think it was, the Morton Salt Company started putting iodine in salt. And that pretty much meant that every American salt user had 
iodine in their diet. But now we're modern people. We aren't using that anymore. We're using sea salt or kosher salt yeah. or Himalayan salt or whatever it is. And it's not iodized. And we're not thinking about other sources of iodine so people get low. Um, that's in, Worldwide, that's the most common reason. And, and by the way, the answer to it is either iodized salt. And, and you need almost none. You need about a third of a teaspoon a day. So it's not very much. Um, the other thing, by the way, sea vegetables loaded with healthy iodine, um, nori, wakame, arame, all of them, seaweeds, good stuff. Uh, the, the other thing, though, is that antibodies, are, that's, the big, that's the biggest reason for it. And antibodies are caused by some exposure to something in your diet. Dairy, meat, eggs do seem to probably be the triggers for that antibody production. That can make you hypothyroid. And depending on how they hit the thyroid, it can sometimes go the opposite. It can make you hyperthyroid. Make you hyperthyroid. Right. Okay, so let's just let's just talk about menopause, and then we're going to move on to COVID. So, are there good foods for menopause? Because yeah. that's clearly where hormone concentrations are diminishing in most women. If you look back in time, uh, medical anthropologists were awestruck back in the 1970s that if you looked at Japan, if you looked at the Yucatan Peninsula, parts of China, women just didn't have hot flashes. Um, they would really not report them, and. At first, the question was, well, you're just kind of modest. You don't want to talk about your health. And so uh, a, me a, a good medical anthropologist went all around Japan and found, no, it was really true. The women just didn't experience hot flashes to any uh, degree. After the westernization of the diet, meat and dairy and fast foods in general came into Japan, um, menopausal issues went way up and so did breast cancer. So researchers think two things happen. One is that the fat content of the diet went up, the fiber content went down, and soy started to get neglected. Uh, soybeans seem, it seems that the isoflavones in soy are not just cancer preventers, but they also seem to mute hot flashes. So, uh, and by the way, same thing on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, it's not soy, but there it's black beans. Um, and westernization has kind of killed all that. So um, researchers have started to test soy itself and they'll use extracts of soy uh, and in some cases, they'll use soybeans themselves. And as I mentioned, mentioned earlier, um, we've been experimenting with just plain old soybeans, which take a Sunday afternoon and take out your pressure cooker. And in an hour, you'll have a supply for the whole week. You put it in little containers and just each day throw some on your salad. Uh, and it's the easiest prescription in the world. And, and see, uh, see what happens. See if your night sweats and the hot flashes don't go down. That's wonderful. All right, let's switch over to COVID now. So can we talk a little bit about, you know, what foods, I mean, are there foods and is there a dietary lifestyle that could be helpful? Now, there is no cure for COVID at this point, so we're not suggesting there's a cure, but could you talk a little bit about how to sort of um, make yourself stronger? Maybe make, is it possible to make yourself a, a little more resistant with dietary choices? Uh, very much so. And let me emphasize, uh, first of all, it is important to try not to get the virus. So that means hand washing, mask wearing, social distancing, all of the public health steps that you've heard of are important. I know that some people debate them. It's not really debatable. You've got to take advantage of ways to not get the virus. But uh, those will fail for many people, despite their best efforts. And we learned a long time ago that people, as soon as the virus was emerging in China, we learned that people with hypertension, diabetes, or obesity were much more likely to have a bad course if they got the virus. For many people, it's asymptomatic. For some, they're a little sick, uh, but they get over it. The people who don't get over it and end up in the ICU or on a ventilator or die are people who have those underlying conditions. So what can you do? Uh, in a number of places, there was, there was a very cool study where they, well, several, several steps. First of all, let's take just diabetes. A person who's got diabetes has probably three times a higher risk of dying of COVID compared to a person who doesn't. A person who's got diabetes in poor control, um, meaning a high blood sugar, uh, they have about an 11% likelihood of dying of COVID. If they have diabetes in good control, mortality is cut down to 1%. Okay, let's say we ignored all that. We didn't do anything. We've got diabetes, rotten control. I'm now hospitalized, but they're, they're talking about whether I need to be in the ICU or not. What do I do? At that point, if you can get the patient in very good control, 
um, their risk of dying of this disease goes way, 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 way down. And so you can do that with drugs, obviously, and there, there's a role for medications and all these things. It'll change your blood sugar within minutes. However, let's say it's you now, and you're watching this program and you're at home, and you think, what if I get this disease? You can dramatically improve your diabetes control within a matter of days or weeks just by getting the animal products out of your diet and keeping your, the fat content uh, of your diet very, very low. It does all the magic that we described. So it brings your blood sugar down and improves your insulin sensitivity. And as it does that, it brings your blood pressure down. It starts to bring your waistline down. And those just those steps alone are money in the bank when it comes to surviving COVID. So it sounds like what you're saying is if you begin to reduce your comorbidities, that 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 is in itself will tra will translate that individual who's now at higher risk for having many more complications to someone who may be uh, who may contract COVID but do very well with it because their comorbidities are are very low or maybe not non existent. Is that correct? Our doctors who are on the front lines of this are always, always, always talking to us about how the people they can't get off the ventilator, the people that they're going to lose, um, are the people with these comorbidities. And I, I'm not talking necessarily about the 85-year-old person. I'm talking about the 45-year-old the person who was obese and thought, well, I'm still young. They got a trace of diabetes and so forth. That's a person you're going to have trouble with who's gonna have trouble with this, this virus. Okay, but it's beyond, beyond tackling the comorbidities. Uh, researchers have been looking also at how viruses interact with various other foods. We need a lot more research here, but the tantalizing uh, possibilities are a few. Number one, um, vitamin G, um, garlic. <laughs> there, there is no vitamin G, okay? But, but uh, this, this is a joke, okay? For any medical students who are watching, don't put that on the board exam. Okay, but garlic. Uh, Garlic has been studied since way before anybody ever heard of COVID. Um, and they started looking at a different virus, cold viruses. And there was a neat study done in Britain where they brought in a large group of people, more, a large group of people, more than 100. And they said, okay, two groups, half of you take garlic. The next 12 weeks, in fact, we'll, we'll disguise it in a little capsule. You won't know you're getting it. Just take the garlic every day. And the other group got the same capsules, but with just a placebo inside. There was a dummy pill. And what they discovered is that the garlic users got colds about two-thirds less frequently than the others. And then you just look at, at your sick days. And also it was cut by about two-thirds. So that's good. Um, a lot of people have said, you know, garlic is a blood purifier and all this stuff. And, and I got to tell you, I have been very skeptical of that. I thought that's a person who just likes Italian food, you know, who's, who's making it up. Uh, but I have to say the study was a good one. And uh, I, th I think it's probably real. And the beauty of it is it's benign. It's not going to hurt you. Uh, vitamin C probably helps. Vitamin D probably helps. Zinc may help as well. Um, we need a lot more research. We've all been blindsided by COVID-19 and nobody has studied these things in relation to COVID-19. But I do think that a person who gets into the hospital or a person who's at risk or a person who's concerned should number one, recognize this as a respiratory disease. If you smoke, if you vape, stop. Number two, if you're on medications, call your doctor now and say, am I on the right dose? If I'm not, let me tune that up so my blood pressure's in the right zone, so my blood sugar's in the right zone. Number three, most importantly, run, do not walk to the healthiest diet you can get. A plant-based diet that's low in fat is the way to tune up your diabetes, your hypertension, get your body weight down, and all of these things in turn ally with your immune system to fight this virus and to keep you around. That sounds wonderful. Now, I, we're, I believe that Physicians Committee and Social Compassion legislation are co-sponsoring a bill in, in New York to ban wet markets. And Social Compassion has a bill before the California State Le Legislature to ban wet markets. Can you talk briefly about the, the, the impact of these wet markets and the evolution of these bizarre um, viruses, these pandemics? That I, I got to tell you, we're going to have a real fight on our hands uh, because the, the local communities have a, a love-hate relationship with these markets. They, they hate them because there's feathers all up and down the street and blood in the gutters and, and to have a slaughterhouse in your neighborhood is stinky. There are 80 of them in New York City. Um, but but some people say this is part of our culture. You know, I like to go out and pick the chicken I'm going to eat tomorrow night and, and so forth. And right now, government doesn't want to shut down any businesses. 
However, public health officials from Dr. Fauci all the way down say you cannot have a live market. And, and the reason for that, we learned it from influenza, that you take a bird uh, or a bat or any animal that can be a live carrier of a virus. Bats carry coronavirus. When people brought them into the live markets in Wuhan, China, then the virus can leap to other animals like a pangolin or to other animals. And two things can happen. The virus becomes more transmissible. So as it changes, as you're crossing from one species to another, you can see changes so the virus no longer just dies out. It can live in the host and it can be transmitted, say, from human to human. But the other change is it can become more dangerous, more pathogenic. So instead of just being a mild illness, it can be a deadly illness. With the 1918 influenza, oh, presumably it appears that a wild, probably a duck, some kind of waterfowl, probably transmitted the virus, the influenza virus, to domestic fowl, uh, geese, uh, chickens, ducks. And then you mix them all together in your market and in your barnyard, and you discover that um, eventually a human beings start getting sick from the virus that came in. And they're transmitting it to other people in the village, and then, and then you've got the, the pandemic. The 1918 pandemic killed 50 million people. And then it never went away. Every year after that, the virus changes genetically, and you get more and more virulent forms and sometimes less virulent forms. Well, in 2018, we didn't have COVID-19. Now we got it. It is not gonna go away much as we wish it would. And if you've got a live animal market where you've got infected people coming in, transmitting the virus, all it takes is reassortment with other viruses to create a more pathogenic virus. For anybody who hasn't had enough of this already, a live animal market is the way to guarantee you're gonna have more and more pathogenic viruses. We're seeing this all the time. There were two uh, markets in Minnesota that were recently tested. And uh, the influenza viruses that were there, the H1N1s, I believe they were, um, were infecting, in this case it was pigs, infecting workers, infected one customer. Um, okay, fair enough with an influenza virus. You do not want to do this with a coronavirus. You were just, it's a time bomb. So yes, uh, in Albany, they will be taking up the case of this bill to ban the live animal markets. It should have happened years ago and it's time for it to happen now. But as I said, it's politically, there will be people fighting it because they want to be able to slaughter a bird. Uh, it's just not worth it. If, if we do, think of this, think of all the businesses shut down. Think of all, all, all the businesses shut down for COVID-19. To, to stop that from happening again, we've got to shut down these live animal markets. That's what it's gonna take. I agree, I agree. So we are having, I mean, we're having such a good time. I know I need to let you go. Can I have a couple more minutes or are we? Yeah, no, that's just fine, sure. All right, so let's let's jump ahead. And I've got some wonderful links that I'll put on. So for the things we're not able to cover, um, I will add these links and I'll go through them very quickly. But th something that's coming up August 6th to 8th is the, um, International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine, and I have had the distinct pleasure of attending since 2013. I think I only missed the first one. I think you started in 2012. I became a Food for Life instructor in 2012, so my first conference was 2013, and I haven't missed one yet. So here is a, um, a, a lovely slide which talks about the conference. It is, can you talk a little bit about this? Who should attend this conference? And, and now it's gonna be virtual. So I wanna give you a chance to talk a little bit about this wonderful conference coming up that I will attend from my computer at my home. Uh, th thank you. The, the conference uh, was designed for medical professionals especially. So doctors, dietitians, nurses, researchers, medical students come. And last year we had more than a thousand people in Washington, D.C. Uh, this year we're virtual uh, because of the pandemic. And it's sort of a double-edged sword. I'm sorry not to have everybody come and taste my breakfast scrambled tofu. I wish, I wish everybody could come join us in, in Washington, D.C. But there is a silver lining in this case, which is that it's a lot easier for people from the West Coast who might have thought they weren't so sure if they wanted to come. Now everybody can attend the ICNM in 2020. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's 20 hours of continuing medical education for people who need that. Um, we're having special sessions on culinary medicine. Uh, Kim Williams is going to be doing a, a special new session that we've just slated uh, related to racial bias in, in medical practice and how to how to tackle that and how, well, anyway, we're just super excited. It's, really, it's going to be wonderful. Now, I understand that some of these, if you're not, because I looked at the, the schedule yesterday and I thought, okay, what am I going to attend? And it's like, 
I want to attend both that are on simultaneously, but I understand that you can pick one to attend live and then the other ones will be up for a month. So you can still see them. At least that's what I read. Is that your understanding? Uh, that, that's exactly right. What we discovered is that although if at a live conference, people are happy to sit there the whole day, uh, people don't want to stare at their computer screen the whole day. So we decided to make it more efficient. So when I'm speaking, you can watch me or you can watch another presentation and whichever one you don't watch now, you can, you can uh, pick up any time you want to. So you'll have them all, you can watch them all, and the timing is all yours, so I hope people will enjoy it. All right, so here are some of the speakers. You have how many speakers? 20, I think, something? Oh, at least. And these are pretty interesting speakers. Um, I actually, can you let, let our audience know who they are, and I'll run a banner on the bottom. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, there's Kim Williams uh, on the left, the head of cardiology at Rush, and the former president of the American College of Cardiology, and just a wonderful friend of the plant-based movement. Uh, Christy Funk, you mentioned, uh, she is the doctor when it comes to, to breast cancer. Uh, Michael Greger, of course, uh, is gonna talk about his new book, How Not to Diet, which is great. Uh, Walter Willett and David Katz. Well, Walter's at Harvard, Dave's, David's at Yale. And they're gonna do a couple of sessions for us, focusing not only on nutrition contro controversies, but also we have a big session on the environment, food and the environment. And then Danielle Bellardo who is a cardiology fellow in Philadelphia. And I got to tell you, Danielle is right on the front lines right now. Actually, she just graduated. She is now in attending. And Yay, she's congratulations. She's coming to work with Dr. Angie Sadeghi at the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine. So she is no longer a fellow. She is now in attending. So You're I right. Well, you right must have it's June 30th. Great. So that's fantastic. So anyway, Danielle's going to be with us too. And okay. we're, we're now I want, to, I want to give a little bit of time, like like maybe a minute. This is an org. This is um, a program that you have for people, physicians, for pe for healthcare professionals with licenses, so they can take their CME courses and get credit. Can and then it's they're free, and that's what I think is amazing. And I've enjoyed watching them just for my own edification, if it was, if I'm at the conference, because I come to the conference and sometimes I can be covering um, as a journalist, covering some other people and I miss the talk. So now I know I can go on to Nutrition CME and see the talk. So many of your talks are on there. Yeah, um, and, and there's a lot more content too that we make specifically for Nutrition CME. For all the people who've got to renew their medical license in December and are thinking, what do I do now? Um, go to Nutrition CME, it is free. You can do it in your pajamas. You can do it Saturday morning and okay. it's, it's fun. All right. And then now you have, you just started, I think, how long ago? This one, the exam room live, which is a live event that you do on Facebook and on YouTube. And I absolutely love it. It's on at 9 a.m. in California and 12 noon in, in uh, on East Coast time. I think it's incredible. And the content is, and I just want to tell everybody that this is what I listen to if I'm going for a walk, if I'm on a treadmill, because I don't have to necessarily watch it. It's fun to watch it, but you can really get this information by using these incredible sources, resources that Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine has. They have this, and you also have have a podcast which has been going on for years and this is something else that's so easy to listen to you know in the, in the days when we were traveling on an airplane so I'm going to put the links to all of these in the comments give me a few minutes after the broadcast is over so everybody gets to see it do we have another two minutes and 30 seconds because I'd like to play the, the video if I can because I, well, I yeah, got that sounds great. sure I'd love to all right and then we'll end it so in 2019 you helped us create a healthier, more compassionate world. Together, we put prevention first, promoted healthful diets, and tackled ethical issues in research and medicine. Animal testing will come to an end at the Environmental Protection Agency due to our two decades of tireless work. From Chicago to China and Delaware to Delhi, we helped communities around the world thrive with a plant-based diet. We ended animal use in eight more medical training programs. We teamed up with doctors and celebrities to fight breast cancer with an innovative four-pronged approach. Our groundbreaking clinical research is giving new hope to people struggling with health problems. We're working with Michigan lawmakers to end deadly experiments and get dogs out of labs. We petitioned the FDA to require a breast cancer warning label on cheese. No more bacon double cheeseburgers in the cardiac unit. We pushed hospitals to go fast food free. 
We work to move Alzheimer's research away from ineffective animal models. Millions of listeners tuned into the Exam Room podcast for motivation and inspiration. We sued the USDA for refusing to protect consumers from fecal contamination of chicken and other meat. We helped hundreds of thousands of people take animals off the menu with the 21 day vegan kickstart. We train scientists on how to transition away from animal research. We're at the American College of Physicians, publishers of the Annals of Internal Medicine. We were the voice of authority against a dangerous industry attempt to exonerate red and processed meat. Why? Because they're not telling you the truth. We educated doctors about the importance of nutrition for patient health. We brought cutting edge pharmaceutical technology to Capitol Hill and urged Congress to move away from animal studies for drug development. The Barnard Medical Center continued to revolutionize patient care with exciting new programs. We launched a campaign to end animal use in general surgery residency programs. Our doctors rallied the public to ditch deadly processed meat and break up with bacon. Break up with bacon! Break up with bacon! Break up with bacon! Thank you for helping us power our important work forward, making the world a better place for people and for animals. You know, I just, I'm so proud to be associated with Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. I donate every year. Um, I'm a, a remembering Rodney member. I have to tell you that this is one of the most incredible organizations because my money works. I see all the hard work that goes into accomplishing all of these educational programs, all of these ways to get information out so people can live a healthy uh, plant-based life and add literally years to their life. And at the same time, we protect animals and all, we didn't get a chance to even talk about that, maybe on another show, where we can talk about all of the animal protection. I know that Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine collaborated with Social Compassion and Legislation, passing two bills that Governor Brown, when he was governor, into law. One was the plant-based options bill requiring that all acute care hospitals, all nursing homes, and all prisons are required to offer at least one plant-based meal at each meal service. The other bill you did was incredible, and that was the Cruelty-Free Cosmetics Act. And for a David and Goliath story, that's what this was. This is passed in California, the fifth largest economy in the world. So whatever goes in California economically, so for these large companies like Revlon, if they've got to stop if, stop using animals in uh, testing new products. So it's not old products, it's all new products. They can't just do it for California. They have to do it for everybody else. So they basically threw their hands up in the air and said, okay, fine, we're not going to test on animals. We did that. That was a collaboration. And I am so proud to be part of that because I was one of those people up in Sacramento doing that. So, you know, I just think that that everything that you started 35 years ago has just been incredible. So <laughs> like a proud mama, I just am so <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. We're not, we're not done yet. <laughs> and you're not done yet. Thank you so much, Dr. Neil Barnard, for, for joining me today. I hope you'll come back in another couple months and, um, and we can do another show talking about specifically some of the new things that are going on. And we can bring that to Jane Unchained on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Thank you so much, everybody. Lisa Carlin reporting live in California with Dr. Neil Barnard in Washington, D.C. Take care of yourself. Please get the book, Your Body and Balance. I had the link. You can get it from Amazon, but you can probably get it at any bookseller. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye.